Good. Welcome to Jewish Culinary Traditions. I'm Lisa Martin with Silver Spring Town Center, and we are so happy to have um, have you joining us for this delicious conversation. It will be the first of annual Jewish Culinary Traditions. This is our eighth diaspora that we are spotlighting, and they are very popular. Uh, who doesn't love food? Anyway, our host is Paula Vienenfeld, and so happy she reached out. Um, and she's with the Jewish Parents, uh, Montgomery Jewish Parents Coalition, which are uh, the, it, presenting in collaboration with Silver Spring Town Center. Just before we get started, I wanted just to mention Silver Spring Town Center is a 501c3 based in the Silver Spring Civic Building, and we are celebrating our 20th year. We present over 100 free arts and entertainment events throughout the year, in person, um, out, indoor and outdoor, as well as virtually, especially in the winter time. And um, we have our 15th annual Silver Spring Blues Festival coming up uh, June 15th. It's always Father's Day Saturday. So mark your calendars. We also celebrate Silver Spring Blues Week, the whole week prior. Um, we have another, in addition to a celebrating Jewish American Heritage Month, May is also AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we have an AAPI culinary discussions panel next um, next Wednesday, May 15th. And on Thursday, we have a travel logs talk with artist Rachel Ann Cross, Silver Spring based artist. And she is going to be speaking on um, sacred treks, uh, walking the Camino de Santiago in Spain and the Chicago pilgrimage in Japan. So that's a travel talk on Zoom also next Thursday. And then um, we also have our um, another Jewish heritage program, um, Jewish Voices Through Poetry. And if I'm, I'm, I don't have my notes in front of me, if I remember correctly, it's, it's on the 22nd of May. Is that correct, Paula? Yes, at 7 p.m. It's in person. Excellent. So and it's great. in person at the Civic Building. So join us. And the next day on the 23rd, we have a Hawaiian night at El Golfo restaurant, Ukulele Hui is performing. And um, Silver Spring Town Center is celebrating its 20 year anniversary. We have a big celebration in the fall. We hope you can join us. And um, we appreciate any support donations of any amount, tax deductible of any amount. I'll put it in the chat later. <laughs> anyway, our, um, our host is Recently retired uh, archaeologist Paula Bienenfeld, who is is active. She's a member of the Jewish Parents of Montgomery County Coalition, and also um, uh, she's an avid cook and baker, and but old school style. I understand and. I, she can tell you more. She also follows uh, certain chefs that she can tell you more about. So I'll pass it on to, to Paula, and then she'll call up our panelists. And we should have time at the end for others to share as well. And you can feel free to put comments, questions in the chat as we go. Thank you. Take it away, Paula. Thank you, Lisa. So this is the first time I'm doing this. First, I just want to say thank you to the amazing Lisa Martin, um, I went to her and said, let's do something for Jewish American Heritage Month, which is May, as most of you know. And um, we hadn't done anything like this before. And the, um, I'm part of the Montgomery County Jewish Parents Coalition. And we really wanted to, most of what we do is seems like fighting anti-Semitism, but we really want to do something where we celebrate Jewish traditions. So uh, Lisa and I spoke and got together a couple times and she really helped steer this whole thing. So I'm very appreciative. And just as a reminder, yes, on May 22nd, 
we have Jewish Voices Through Poetry at 7 p.m. And this is in person. And we have a lot of really wonderful published uh, and new poets, Jewish poets, that will be there reading poetry and discussing po their poems. So people could attend that. It's in the Silver Spring Town Center building uh, downtown. So uh, she, Lisa said a little bit about, about me. I, I'm an archeologist recently retired and um, I do like to cook and I like to bake, but I really am not that inventive and I mostly follow recipes. And the books I told her about were um, books, a cookbook, an old timey cookbook by Jenny Grossinger and the um, Molly Berg cookbook, which I'm, I'm sure many of you may remember. So I just kind of follow those recipes. I'm not so inventive, but it's, you know, just kind of the usual brisket and so forth type things. So I wanted to introduce our first um, cook, Marissa Kilson. She is a clerical social worker and therapist, but she likes to bake like a bubby. So go ahead, Marissa. I think I'm still I think you're, oh yeah <laughs> um hi thank you so much for um for organizing this I think it's great to get to celebrate um Jewish food and get to celebrate Jewish culture and, instead of kind of always bringing on the you know fight against anti-semitism but just celebrating celebrating this aspect of our culture um, and so I, I took this as a challenge to talk about the story of my life through Jewish food, um, because in order to understand Jewish food, it, you have to understand the stories and people connected to it and through the generations. Um, my childhood relationship to Jewish food connected strongly to my bubby and to my mom. I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors on my mother's side. And both my Bubby and Zadie died when I was really young. And though my time with them was certainly too short, they really had a huge imprint on my life in a profound way. Um, so many of my earliest memories with them do in fact, of course, involve food, especially for Shabbat. Um, I still have one very vivid memory of my Bubby. She sat me in front of the TV and while she cooked in the other room. And instead of a bowl of popcorn, like most American kids, I was given a huge, huge bowl of potatoes. Um, and the smell and taste of those potatoes are still with me even after 35 years that she's been gone. Um, my Bubby did not write down her recipes. Uh, and she was incredibly traditional. When my aunt was planning to get married, she followed her mother around the kitchen and wrote down everything that she did. Um, and in order to be able to take those recipes on, however, the potato recipe was never written down. And so in my early 30s, I spent several years trying to recreate that recipe purely from taste. Uh, it was, I'd like to say it was about half about the potatoes and about connecting with her. Um, I actually got pretty close to getting it right. Um, chicken seasoned with salt and paprika, roasted with red skin potatoes, that was important, onions, carrot, lemon, and a lot of garlic cooked together in one big pot. Um, and somehow the magical combination of ingredients got it pretty close to her potatoes. Um, as for my mother, when I think of the Jewish holidays, I think of my mom. Her brisket is above all others. And I know there are going to be other people here who are going to say say opposite, but I'm, I'm going to have, since I get to start us off tonight, sorry, hers is the best. That sweet and sour uh, brisket made with cranberry mm. and chili sauce and just nothing tastes more like the holidays than her brisket. Um, she would also, of course, try and bring her mother back to our holiday table through food. Um, through my Bubby's cocoa or her 
honey cake. Um, and in fact, many, many years ago, um, she was able to submit these two recipes to the Holocaust Survivors Cookbook, which was a charity that went to a soup kitchen in Israel. Um, and when I started developing an interest in cooking um, as a teenager, the very first thing that I can recall baking on my own was my Bubby's honey cake. And since I forgot the honey, it actually tasted disgusting. Um, but I'd like to think that I have come very far since then, um, since I now do remember to include the main ingredient in a recipe. Um, but it was really as I was in college and going to Hillel and Chabad at College Park, um, that I started to really explore Jewish foods as an adult on my own terms. And, and they were typical Ashkenazi foods, such as soup and challah and brisket. Um, and they were all very integral to that Shabbat experience. But challah, um, the braided bread, which is typically eaten on Shabbat, for those who don't know, um, was a bridge in my baking journey. And that really brought me from young adulthood to where I am today. Um, when I was in college, the Rebbitzin Malka Koretsky, she gathered some students who were interested and taught us how to knead challah, make it just right. Good challah should be a tiny bit sweet, eggy, fluffy, um, because there's just nothing more disappointing than a dry challah. Um, her recipe was actually from the Spices and Spirit Cookbook. And for years, I used that recipe to make challah for the high holidays. It was a, I would turn this five pound bag of flour into eight challahs, which then I would have for all of our holiday dinners. Um, and the challenge with this recipe was it included a fresh yeast cake, which I had to track down because it's not a standard item in any grocery store. I even went as far as meaning to call bakeries in order to reserve it in advance. And I found that when I was a mother, I no longer had time to track down cakes of fresh yeast. So I needed to change how I was making challah at that point. Um, and anybody here who's a parent of young kids will know exactly what I mean by that. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. In my early 20s is when I decided I wanted to take over some of the high holiday meals. And I started hosting Rosh Hashanah in particular. It's my favorite holiday because the Jewish New Year is a time for reflection, renewal, and sweetness. And I will tell you that nobody leaves my table hungry. Um, and I would be really sad if they did. Most of the time, I will admit, I make Ash traditional Ashkenazi cuisine, which the chicken soup and matzo balls, which I will say I know that recipe backwards and forwards. Um, I can do it from memory. Um, and I would say if there's any dish that if people think, oh, what's Marissa's best dish? It's my chicken soup and matzo balls. Um, and I hope that will, my, my kids and grandkids will one day say that like, hers is the best. Um, <laughs> brisket, <laughs> potatoes, kugel, carrot simmers, you know, apple, apple kugel, stuffed cabbage, kreplak. I, I try and experience the, the sort of range of Ashkenazi cuisines. But in recent years, my husband, who is in fact a phenomenal cook, <laughs> opened my eyes to seeing Jewish food in a very new way um, through our many, many, many cookbooks. And yes, this is our cookbook library behind me, um, one portion of it. I have learned more and more about Jewish communities throughout the world and try to bring um, the different cuisines and their recipes to our holiday table. So sometimes I'll experiment with Sephardic ingredients like orange and olive and cucumber and a variety of salads with eggplant and lemon. 
Uh, other times I will try very different dishes like yellow split pea and pumpkin soup from Morocco or chicken sofrito from Spain, masala chicken from India, uh, fried artichokes from Italy, shawarma chicken from Israel. Wow, that's so quite a range. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Great. And, um, but the most important thing um, that being, that brings me to motherhood today, um, like so many people during the pandemic, I started baking more. And I decided to make challah for my family every Friday instead of once a year and became determined to find my new favorite challah recipe. Um, and while I've experimented with, with dozens, um, I settled on a couple. Um, Adina Sussman's golden challah is one of my favorites and Jamie Geller's one hour challah if you're in a pinch. Um, and now the best part is passing on the tradition to my daughters whose little hands are learning to braid the six strands of challah just like I have. And passing on my traditions to my girls is the best part of cooking and baking. Um, we like to make homentash and apuram, lakis, Hanukkah, and Faroset, Passover. And so I have decided that the primary ingredient in all Jewish cooking is Lador Vador, which means from one generation to the next. Thank um, you. Thanks so uh, much. Great. Uh, Thank you. That kind of reminded me, my grandmother would made an amazing potato soup that I could never replicate. And I remember talking to my cousin and out of the blue, she said, wow, do you remember grandma's potato soup? So that was, you know, really brought back the memories. Thank you. And Thank so you. Uh, Courtney, I think is speaking. Hi. Courtney, tell me. Great. So uh, just a little introduction. You have an Ashkenazi background, but you're a Persian wife, and I met your family, so I know, and you've been cooking a eclectic variety of uh, comfort foods for them. So yes. go ahead, take it away. Right. <laughs> um, just like my friend who spoke earlier, you know, the brisket, the challah, the chicken soup, the kugels, all of those things are made in our house but there's also a separate component or an additional component of persian food um you reminded me my dad had a cousin who was a holocaust survivor and she made the most amazing cookies called pagachols and i have no idea they were really hard they were hard little like tea cookies i don't know we would dip them and i finally found a recipe to replicate them and i make them mm, a couple times a year for the family um, but because my husband is Persian and he's from Tehran, there are certain things that are very special and unique to his culture. And um, instead of having matzo balls, we have something called gondi. And gondi is ground chicken. It's it's exactly like a matzo ball. It's ground chicken with cardamom and um, um, turmeric and salt and pepper and garlic. And it's put into the chicken soup and it's it's exactly like a matzo ball, but it's chicken. So it's a whole meal added with um, chickpeas in the soup and onions. And um, that's pretty much it. And potatoes, boiled potatoes. There are a lot of stews in Persian cooking. Um, my daughter's favorite stew is something called reme, which is a split pea, yellow split pea soup with stew with stew meat and tomato sauce so on our table at any given day you can find ashkenazi food persian food or both friday night we usually have a mixture of both there's usually gondi on the table um along with our challah and kugel or chicken and brisket whatever whatever it is at the diet chuck roast whatever it is but there's usually a little bit of everything and um we also are pretty eclectic we during the pandemic my daughter um, was in college and she had some extra time so she would learn how to cook and she would make um, shawarma Israeli mix like she was on all the cooking channels on online and she was learning from these cooks what to cook and now even I follow one on Instagram her name is Ruhama and she's hysterical because she says my food is the best um, but I love to watch her but our family traditions are absolutely a blend of Persian Jewish cooking 
Because if you ask any non-Jewish person, an Iranian person, what Gundi is, they'll say, we have no idea. It's very unique to Jewish Persians. Um, and we do a lot of grilling too, because they did a lot of kebabs. So it's really a lot of fun. And that's not usually my forte because my husband doesn't let me play with the barbecue, which is fine by me. Um, but there, on any given day, there's all kinds of different things on our table. Um, Persian food, Ashkenazi food, Israeli food, it's, it's all there. So when people come over, they never know what to expect, but they know that they'll eat well. There you go. Thank you for having this. This is great. Oh, good. I'm so glad you could come, Courtney. We'll have to catch up. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> yes. Rena, uh, Rena Konar, are you still here? I know she was having some trouble, I think. Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Yes. So, uh, Rena, right. Oh, there you are. Okay. And you're a foodie. You said you love to be a foodie and you keep kosher. You keep a kosher house. So, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was not raised keeping kosher. It's it came along in my early thirties, um, and so my background is my grandparents came from Russia to Western Canada uh, at the turn of the last century. My parents were born in Western Canada, and then when my mother and my father found each other, my father took a job with Dupont, and they plopped him down in this small city in North Carolina, uh, where they were for 21 years. And there was a textile fibers plant there. And uh, then we moved, when I was eight, to Wilmington, Delaware. And as all Jews, we incorporated, all these people in my family incorporated what was in their area, what was, uh, normal in their area, what was prevalent in their area. Um, so um, my parents had long since left the kosher lifestyle, um, but they would make concessions. They would have subs from the Italian sub shop in Claymont, Delaware on the porch on paper plates or they would uh, get half a bushel of steamed crabs and we would also eat that on the porch and paper <laughs> plates. Um, so, but I wanna talk about this little Jewish community in North Carolina. So we, we, we were a community of about 30 families in about a 100 mile radius. And um, most of the people, uh, sometimes there was Southern accents, people, Jews from the South, but most of the people were employees of DuPont and they all had New York accents. And then there were my parents, my dad would say A uh, with their Canadian accents, my parents. Anyway, everyone obviously missed the Jewish food that they grew up with. And whenever someone would go up North to visit, we would give them our orders. So uh, in our family, my dad loved salami. So they would bring back a kosher salami for my dad, kind of like this one. <laughs> we got this, we got this um, a few weeks ago in Cleveland from a kosher butcher there who makes his own salami. We were there for the total eclipse of the sun. So uh, that tradition stays on in my family. Although this is my son's, he bought it for himself. I am not supposed to eat things like this anymore. Unfortunately, that's what comes with age. Um, we would go up sometimes to my uncle's house in Scarsdale, New York. And of course there was a larger Jewish community there and we would bring back for everyone in the community bags, brown paper bags and bags and bags of bagels. And then my mother would distribute them and uh, then she would stock up our freezer with our bagels and they would be doled out through the year to last. Um, so also the salami, my dad doled that out to us. So uh, let's see. So uh, I have my mother 
unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And I have, this is her scrapbook. I'm not going to open it because it's very delicate, but she has transposed recipes that she had been gathering from the late 50s until about 2018 when she basically stopped cooking so much. And it just goes on and on. There are things that she took off of PBS from uh, Jacques Pepin to um, Kolo recipes in the back here. Now, I must say, my mother, we rarely made, she rarely made kugels, and I really don't like to make kugels, but um, every once in a while I do. I just think that they're full of fat and eggs and mayonnaise. Ah. So um, my mother was quite the cook, and she loved to bake, and uh, her specialty was something called kamishbrate, which is Mandelbrot, and I don't know what the difference is. I don't know what Kamishbrot means, but it was so delicious and toasty and cinnamony. Um, so she perfected that over the years. I made this uh, when I first got married. I would make it, but my family thinks that dessert is chocolate, so uh, I don't make it that often anymore. Um, um, so in our little Jewish community, my mother would bake and bake and bake. And then the big time of year came when my grandmother, Bubby Bertha, came down from Canada to visit us. She'd stay with us for a month, and then she'd go to my uncle's house in Scarsdale for a month. And in that month, she would take over our kitchen for about four days. My cousin, Michelle, who was from was in Scarsdale says it was a full on Canadian invasion, my grandmother in our kitchen. And she would make halot, little four inch halot braided uh, halas for us. And we would fill the, the freezer with them. Now, my grandmother was not one of those warm and fuzzy grandmothers. She was kind of judgmental and she didn't like girls. And we were a family with three girls. And I think that she wanted to show her love to us by making what she did best, which was were these little halot. And she also made something called flooden, which I don't know where she got the recipe. It wasn't from Russia, but a Russian recipe. It was little individual fruit cakes. Um, not my favorite, but she would make these halot and the flooden and uh, bialis. And then, of course, we would shove them in the freezer. My grandmother always complained about American flour. She would say, oh, it's just not, it's not the same as Canadian flour. And we'd say, oh, Bobby, what are you talking about? Flour is flour. But now come like 30, 40 years later, and we find out, yes, there's hard wheat flour and soft wheat flour and bread flour, and Bobby was right. This, this I've heard that and, too. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that about different amounts of gluten and different types of flour that yeah. it makes a big difference now. So anyway, thank you so much. This has just been You're really welcome. fascinating. I appreciate it. So the the next uh, person, Naomi Ellie Mella. Hey. Yep, you there? Okay. I'm here. Um, Oh, terrific. So you're going to, um, you're a Moroccan cook, actually, and a foodie. So go ahead. Oh, okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, just um, maybe 20 seconds about uh, my background. I was born and raised in Ashkelon in Israel to a family that had uh, immigrated from Casablanca, Morocco. I think I am the only Sephardic person in this panel, but maybe I'm wrong. I live in Rockville um, and I have three children. I teach Hebrew at GW. And I thought about what I could share with you. And then it just hit me, maybe I would, uh, I could uh, compose the 10 commandments uh, or the 10 guidelines for Moroccan food. Um, speaking of brisket, before I begin, I've never had brisket. I've never heard about 
brisket till I came to the US. So number one, food is more than just food. Food is a quick fixer to all your problems. The closest example I can think of Sephardic family is the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Um, it's all about food. You're sad, eat something. You're happy, eat something. Um, there's nothing uh, that a good Moroccan meatball cannot fix. Moroccans are very passionate about the food. There's a joke uh, that every Moroccan recipe starts with the line, calm down first. So the second thing is uh, always tons of food. Moroccans, uh, by definition, by the way, keep kosher. I also keep kosher to this day. Uh, every Friday night starts with about 15 kinds of dip salads and appetizers on the table on the Shabbat table, roasted eggplants and fried eggplants, roasted peppers, slow cooked tomatoes, something that is called medbucha, spicy carrots, beets and cumins, and whatnot. Uh, there's another joke uh, in a test, uh, once in a test, a Moroccan uh, woman is shown a picture of a table of three legs. She's asked, what's wrong with this picture? And she says, ah, it's easy. There are no appetizers on it. Um, the <laughs> third, I hope you got the joke. The third thing is that Moroccans do not eat. Do you want to eat? It is an insult to ask. You have to state it as a fact. If you're a true Moroccan, sit down to eat. Number four, if you are the guest, do not refuse. You do not stand a chance. I've seen my mom forcing friends and relatives to sit down as a little girl. It was scary, but guess what? I'm the same. I do the same thing. Um, number five is, um, I think we are the only uh, group, ethnic group, that eat ho whole artichokes boiled with lemon and salt as dessert. We eat it after the Shabbat meal, the Friday night meal. We eat uh, uh, artichokes, boiled artichokes, not uh, uh, an apple cake, uh, no ice cream. It's funny, but it's something that is very typical. Um, number six is that we Moroccans also have a five o'clock tea, not just uh, Queen Elizabeth and the uh, Brits. So at five, we normally would sit down for a mint tea in Rifat. Rifat is the name of uh, biscuits uh, with fennel seeds and sesame, very good. Uh, number seven, we never had any dairy dishes, no dairy food at a Moroccan household, not even on Shavuot. We maybe, we had a, a toast uh, with some butter or cheese in the morning, not more than that. Um, the only exception is that on Purim, the whole, one of the holidays, we ate a type of couscous that is called bulkuksh. And this couscous uh, is eaten with buttermilk and or butter. Uh, number eight, everything at my house and in many other Moroccan houses is made from scratch. That's how I grew up. 100% of the food is homemade. And when I say 100%, I do not mean just dishes, salads, meats, cookies, cakes. No, I'm talking about condiments like mayo, pasta sauce, fruit, fruit preserves, wine, pickled olives and what not. One day, I, I was a teenager, I craved for store-bought food. Uh, so my mom finally bought me hot dogs and burgers and I was so, so, so thrilled about it. I remember it to this day. My number one is um, traditions are not to be broken. Uh, you know, I come from Israel. Stability is the last thing I have in my life as an Israeli definitely uh, um, taking into account uh, the, whatever is happening now. But Moroccan fish is the one thing that every in every Moroccan house um, uh, is eaten every Friday night, every Friday night, peacetime, wars time, uh, war times, rain or shine, I do not know. We all sit down and eat piquant fish that it's fish that is cooked with peppers, garlic, cilantro. Some add chickpeas. I add fava beans, and um, yeah, it's a very it's it's a dish that we always have week after week. Number ten, it is in my veins, or in my veins, you you will not find blood, but maybe matbucha, the 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 red uh, tomato dip. 
I don't know, but but seriously, um, um, it's something that is instilled in me. Um, I would like also to wrap it up by telling you that I'm the owner of a blog, uh, a website that is called Moroccan Mommy. You can find many, many recipes um, from the uh, Moroccan cuisine. I do cooking classes, even a class on how to make Moroccan appetizers in one hour. I cook for families and I'm working on a cookbook. So I'm going to post uh, the link to my website. And if you have any questions, if you would like to meet, if you'd like to continue doing, uh, co collaborating, doing uh, other events together, let me know. Thank oh, great. You. Thank you. Fascinating. Thanks. And so um, let's see, Aviva Pacman. Hi. Hi. So I have you down that you're a program specialist in your uh, professional life and that you love to uh, bake challah. Thank you. Yes, that's me. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I loved hearing what everybody else has shared. Um, I resonate with a lot of things people have shared. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my connections to Jewish culinary. So a little bit about me. I'm from Chicago. I currently live in Chicago. And how I hopped on the Zoom was one of my colleagues through Playworks, which is where I'm a program specialist. Um, and I connected through Jewish food. And I feel like that is a huge statement to not only uh, the Jewish culture and religion, but the fact that we can connect on anything and food is a big component of that. Um, so a little bit about me is that uh, my mom is Sephardic. She is a uh, Guatemalan uh, born in Chicago, but our family is originally from Guatemala and Spain. My dad is Ashkenazi. He is also from Chicago, been here for a few generations. Um, but what I love about both my parents is that they each bring a different viewpoint um, to not only Jewish culinary, but Judaism in general when it come, came to our household growing up. Um, and so I think that having both uh, an Ashkenazi dad and a Sephardic mom has played a big role in how um, Jewish culinary has showed up in my current household. And growing up, some of my fondest memories of um, the holidays and any tradition that came along um, with the holidays was the food. Um, my fondest memories growing up was being in the kitchen with not only my mother, but both my grandmothers and my grandfathers and my dad, watching them all cook for every relative that lived in the Chicago area. We grew up in a really small house, but it didn't matter the holiday, didn't matter how many people were invited. We made sure that there was room for everybody at the table. Um, and at that table, we saw a mixture of a uh, combination of different foods. We saw my bubby's jelly meatballs. And then we also saw mole. So it would be a combination of a lot of different foods, but they were all um, came from the different parts of our family. And so growing up, I spent all this time in the kitchen with my mother and my grandmother watching them cook, whether I was spending Shabbat at my Nona's house or my Bubby's house, we were cooking before Shabbos. Um, and something that I still hold today in my own household is a little box with all of their recipes and things that I collected over the years. Um, and I think it's one of my prized possessions. If there were ever a fire in our household, God forbid, I think that would be something that I grabbed on my way out because of uh, those recipes don't really live anywhere else. Um, but because I grew up with such a mix of a Sephardic mom and Ashkenazi dad, uh, I had a lot of different flavors of food, foods. Um, and with those traditions, I now carry those in my household. And so something that I really love to this day is that once a month I get to host a Shabbat luck where I have friends from all over Chicago who come and if they don't have a place to eat for Shabbat, they come and they stay with us or they bring a dish and they stop by, they come for dessert, whatever part they can, um, they can be present with that. And so I have a mixture of different recipes that I love to cook every Shabbat, whether, you know, it's my mother's chicken or, you know, my Bubby's uh, little puffs. Um, and to see what other people bring has really opened my eyes to not only the traditions that I grew up with, but other people's traditions. And so that's really sparked a passion in myself. So when I'm not working, I really love to spend time exploring recipes um, that I can then bring to my next Shabbat table. So not only do I love to explore new recipes, but my favorite part of my week is baking my challah. And just like all the times I spent in the kitchen with my Bubby and my Nona and my mom, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen when I was in college um, I was an intern for Hillel at Bradley University, and I was their challah for hunger intern. And I thought that that was the coolest position that I got to bake challah for all the Jewish kids on campus. 
every single week. And didn't matter if I was stressed with classes or making it to, you know, my part-time job. I knew that every week I had this time to be challah and that I could spread that, you, you know, the, the blessings that challah brings to other people. Um, and I love that part of my week, not only when I was in college, um, but after I graduated and moved back to Chicago and um, I got married and I started my new job, I started this whole new chapter. What stayed consistent was my challah baking every week. And I felt like that was something that was always um, instilled in me through my parents, but also through, you know, after I became my own person of that, I wanted to continue on that tradition in my household. And so every week when I bake my challah, I take that time as my own time, but also my time to think about what I want and, you know, my next chapters and how I can pass those on to my own children one day, God willing. Um, but long story short, all the traditions that I had growing up has been something that has shaped me as my own individual, but something that now I try to bring to my own household when new people come into it and spend Shabbats with us. Um, and I really just love hearing everybody else's stories, um, including, you know, I was hearing someone talk about, um, Marissa, you were talking about your Bubby's Kugel and trying to figure out that recipe. My mom and I had a similar experience trying to figure out one of our uh, grandmother's cookie recipes. We were just going, we kept trying it over and over again, and it was amazing to figure out, figure out the end result. But I loved doing that and hearing about, you know, Naomi or Sephardic traditions and how those are carried on into your house. And I love that that connects all of us, even though I don't know many of you and I, I've never met any of you before. I love that we can connect on that. And I think that's what really has hold uh, true to me. So thank you for letting me speak. Oh, thank you. I just want to interject with, it's so stressful, such a stressful time to be a Jew right now. And I just have to say, listening to everybody's stories is really very comforting at this time. And I really appreciate everybody uh, telling about yourselves and everything that's so important to you in terms of food and memories. So um, Anna Rosenfeld, you're up. Are you there? Yep, just got to mute. Oh, oh, great. Hi. Oh, okay. yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed listening to everyone's stories here. Uh, and I just, I prepared some stories, but I'm thinking, gosh, I don't even know what, what I will include or what not. So I'm just going to go into it. So I was born in Moscow, former Soviet Union uh, in the 70s. Um, it was only a half a century after my grand, uh, my great grandparents moved their families from shtetls, the villages in the Soviet bloc into Moscow. So majority of the time, you know, in Jewish history in, in Russia or the Soviet bloc, Jews really were not allowed to live in the cities. It wasn't until probably, you know, the early 20th century, or maybe even mid, um, you know, more like 20s, when they started flooding into Moscow uh, for educational opportunities. But until then, it was all, you know, small villages. And so you had what you had. You had whatever you grew in your garden, not a lot of meat. You had, you know, organ meats. So very different um, Yiddish cuisine. And, you know, we like to think that we kind of influenced Russian cuisine with our Jewish cuisine, although they claim that they take credit for some of it. Um, so my paternal grandmother, um, whose father baked matzah for his Orthodox shtetl residents um, near Zhitomir, it's this uh, town in um, in Ukraine, you may have heard in the news because of the Russian invasion. Um, but she hosted Jewish holiday celebrations um, under a weary um, eye of the Soviet government. So we had to really practice as much as we could our Judaism underground. Um, and so I spent summers with her and remember her making sirniki. She would mix farmer's cheese with egg and baker's flour, which she would then fry in copious amounts of oil and serve with sour cream and they would be fluffy and and light it was it was a good supper it's basically eaten at the time of american dinner uh but towards the evening so um you know because lunch was the heaviest meal of the day and so they were so rich inside with a toasty flavor on the outside slightly crispy consistency um and so the neighbors from the entire Dacha community would come and they would they would find a reason to come for dinner, right? Like they would kind of hanging out before dinner. They're one minute they're discussing, you know, they're sharing some new gardening hacks with her, and the next they're at the supper table because they get invited, of course, um, and uh, probably not knowing they're experiencing Yiddish kitchen, whether they like it or not. <laughs> um, so that's how a lot of Yiddish recipes, I think, made it into Russian cuisine. And on Shabbat 
tables of European and American diaspora. Um, and so um, some of the other things that I remember, um, you know, out of necessity, we did soup a lot, right? Like Russians and their soup are inseparable. <laughs> uh, and a lot of them, you know, came from, from Jewish recipes. So one that you probably have heard much about is, you know, when you associate with Russian cooking is borscht. Well, that's actually a Ukrainian dish, which really came, we think, from Yiddish cooking. Um, and that's, again, whatever you grew in your um, in your garden, in vegetable garden is what you had. So um, meat was really only available on occasion. So you, you put in, um, you know, the pickled cabbage, um, I'm sorry, pickled beets, cabbage, and potatoes. Um, so you get your iron fixed that way. Uh, and then you have this Ukrainian svikolnik, and you make that you know, into a soup, and you eat it with a dollop of sour cream. Actually, there is a part in the movie Gold, if you've seen it, where um, she invites Henry Kissinger into her house and uh, offers him a bowl of borscht. And that's how diplomacy was done in the 70s uh, in, in, you know, the, the, her kitchen. So um, there's also you, you, uh, Lithuanian variation of that. Um, when Lithu Lithuanian Jews, you know, making Aliyah came to Israel, it was very hot. They were not used to, you know, being Northerners to these hot temperatures. So they would make, um, um, you know, these punishing temperatures. So, so they would have a version of this soup, essentially involving cold vegetables, and they would include beets and potatoes and, and cucumbers and fresh herbs, and they would place that on the bottom of a bowl, uh, and then they would thin sour cream or yogurt, and then that's what they would pour over the bowl. And so it was just very refreshing and a lifesaver in the desert. Um, some of the other things that my mother actually made um, is uh, kishka. <laughs> so kishka was originally <sighs> made with um, beef intestine, but she would take the chicken neck and, you know, it'd be washed out well, and then um, she would stuff it with uh, flavored flour, onion, eggs, and fat, which is also known as schmaltz. And that's another thing is, you know, you take... You, you use all parts of a chicken, right? It is a, in a peasant uh, growing up, you know, many generations ago, that's how they did it, is they would take the, eat whatever parts of a chicken, everything was used, and then the skin would be cooked in the, in the skillet and um, until it's crisp. So then that's, um, it was called squarky, <laughs> squarky, squarky. Uh, and it would be stored in a, in a jar, like a glass jar. And so it'd be that crispy skin in the kind of solidified fat. So some of that would go in there. And uh, um, and then she would take that and she would tie it off with a strain and she would boil it in chicken soup. So then when it comes out, it's this just completes a, a dish, right? You don't have anything else meaty for, for dinner, all you need really a complete meal is you got the chicken soup and you got the kishka that was cooked in chicken soup. And it's just very juicy yet it has the body to it. So, um, and then you could take the squarky that you stored in a jar and you would um, spread it over black bread. Uh, so it's kind of like a Jewish bacon, <laughs> you could say. So um, let's see. I'm gonna cut cut it off here because I know we're shutting we're running low on time. There's so many great recipes. Hopefully, you found um, this the stories interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So, uh, Lissy, am I pronouncing that correct? Lissy Sorrentos from it's Silver a, Spring. Pardon? Hi, it's it's Lissy. Lissy. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. So you're that's all right. Okay, Silver Spring homemaker. I've got mother of two, and you bake. A very good challah. So let's hear about it. Well, so I um I really didn't bake challah before the pandemic. In fact, I don't think of myself as a baker at all. Um, I like to cook, but I'm not huge on recipes. And then the pandemic came, and everybody was baking bread. And um, you know, I felt like, well, I, we did the sourdough thing in the neighborhood, but I finally had time on Fridays to to give the time to baking challah. 
And it really began to foment for our children a much more like Jewish identity. They've always been, they've always been I, you're very proud of their Jewishness, but making the time to like take the Sabbath and have Shabbat be important to us and have challah as part of that was really important. And given what's been going on within the Jewish community right now, I'm so deeply grateful that we've taken the time to really, to give them that identity and for them to, to focus on it and understand that Shabbat is important to us and that it's something that we set aside time, time aside for every Friday night. And that, that came about through challah. I am a cookbook hoarder. I have everything from, I mean, this is my 1968 Temple Emanuel and Worcester Mass cookbook that was done by the sisterhood that my mother has and gave to me to, uh, I think uh, Paula was talking about Jenny Grossinger's cookbook and, um, and Adina assessment and I'm a cookbook hoarder. And so as the pandemic progressed, I started just trying out different recipes. And at that time I had time to make follows that had double rises, et cetera. And then kids went back to school and life changed and, and the time went away. And so now I've really narrowed it down to um, Connie Applebaum's recipe from Totally Kosher. And it's actually for a pull apart challah that I've just sort of switched into a braided challah and taken a tradition from a book called Braided, which is the journey of a thousand challahs. And the thing that it does is while the yeast is blooming, you stop and you say like, that I'm making this dough in the merit of, and then you mention somebody who is important to you, who maybe is sick and needs healing, who you're thinking about that week. And so it gives further meaning to the weekly challah. And um, my daughter, who's 11, joins me in it. Challahs become very important to us. I have my my challah earrings that I like to wear <laughs> on Shabbat. <laughs> it's a it's part of the tradition, and um, it's really served to to make family time more important. What was interesting after the pandemic, our PTO does a lot of events at our school on Friday night, and I've always been on the PTO board, and we'd stop going to them because making challah and and giving focus to the Sabbath became important and we started saying, no, we're not gonna do these events on, on Shabbat anymore. And so now we've noticed like International Night they're doing tomorrow for the first time. They're starting to change it because they realize that people are saying, wait a second now, we can't participate on Friday night, you know? And so um, through food, it gave us the identity, which gave us the strength to start to change other people on the way they see things. And that's just been very important to us. So that's all, thanks for letting thanks. me share. Thanks very much. That was great. Yeah. Um, Shelly, you're there. Shelly Rude Wernick, who's managing director of the Center on Aging and yeah, and Trauma and the Holocaust Survivor Initiative, who said that um, she, let me see, I'm writing this. <laughs> she, you used to cook, but didn't have enough time lately since becoming a mom. And I see your kids in the background. So Hopefully yeah. you will get inspired by the program and you were going to talk about and Hollywood foods, correct? Holiday Thank foods. You. Holiday Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, holiday. Right. holiday. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Paula. This is, I'm, I'm talking to Paula and all of these friends. This is Marvin. Marvin, you want to say hi? This is Marvin. Marvin is almost four. Hi. And, um, I, uh, I had to think very hard, actually, about what I wanted to present and for you this. And what we just made? Oh, uh, we just made you something want... that's not food. It is blocks, which is, yeah. that, which have letters on them um, to keep us occupied. Uh, but I thought of what I what I do make now. I have um, three young kids, and um, time is very short in the evening, so meals are quick. But I do use all of the recipes that come on the back of PJ Library books because they're easy and they're great to do with kids and they're really good. So um, I will tell you about two of them that I've made. One is a hamantaschen recipe. It came from a book called the Better Than Better Than Best Hamantaschen or Better Than Best Parm. I don't remember. Does anyone, if anyone's familiar with that book, um, it's a Purim story about cats and uh, <laughs> as they as they are. And the back of it has a hamantaschen recipe. I had never made hamantaschen before. I always was intimidated and thought like, that's they're so hard to make and hamantaschen like are not that good. So if I'm going to put time into something, like make something that's amazing or chocolate based, you know, like hamantaschen are just kind of hamantaschen. But the recipe on the back of that book is very good. And um, the super secret ingredient, which is in the book, 
and in the recipe is um, orange peel. You put a little bit of orange peel in the. It's okay. You put a little bit of orange peel in the um, in the mix, uh, and it just gives it extra sweetness. Um, and the other recipe that I love um, from PJ Library is a recipe for harosets, and it's um, it's just called Persian harosets, and um, it's basically every kind of nut, like roasted and then ground together in a in a food processor to a, like a very fine paste with um, lots of kinds of dried fruits and a pear and also an orange and all of that like ground together and mixed together and it makes just this delicious healthy um, fruit nut spread almost help you in one minute okay it's okay it makes this delicious fruit nut spread uh, no, no wine is in it because it's a PJ Library one. I, I imagine the original recipe has does call for wine, but I made it without. Mm -hmm. And um, my children loved it. And what I ended up doing because it made so much is I put the, a little bit of harosets into um, ice cube trays and froze them. And so whenever we wanted a healthy, sweet treat, we would just pop out one of those ice cubes. Um, or two or three of them and and eat the Persian harosets. Um, I don't, I, I wish that the PJ library would have like the yeah. author of the recipe because I don't even know who to give credit to. Like even just a name, you know, there's no name. There's the author of the book. So maybe the author of the book is the author of the recipe. I, I don't actually know, um, but I'm really grateful that the PJ library, which is, uh, it's a program that sends um, books, Jewish related books to Jewish families um, to give them an education. And I, I really appreciate the books and love when they have recipes on them. How do you spell karosets? Karosets, it's a C-H, like a sound, C-H-A-R-O-S-E-T. Easy. Maybe? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's something you put um, on the Seder table, on the Seder plate. Thought. It's got a, a, you know, sort of a, a different meaning. But it's, your idea of the frozen one is, it, what a great idea. Yeah, and um, I have a, a friend. I have a friend who is a professional chef. She's not Jewish. But one, when I made this paste, I was really proud of how it came out. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, and... Uh, I gave I gave her some and she was like, wow, that's really good too. She agreed. Um, and I wanted to know what I could use it with, like just as a regular food, not necessarily as part of the Seder ceremony as, a, you know, as a, as a symbolic ceremonial food, which is what harosets is normally used for. It's not normally like a meal or even a side item. It's like you eat it as part of the, the Seder on Passover, but only once a year. Um, and she suggested that I pair it with pear <laughs> I wouldn't have come up with that word pair it with um cheese or apples and so what I ended up doing is making little apple wedge slices and then putting um like a thin slice when it's frozen the fruit and nut mixture you can kind of cut it into a slice and I would put like an apple slice and then the frozen haroset paste you know nut paste and then another apple slice and make like little, little apple sandwiches and they're absolutely delicious um and healthy and you know, all natural, and they last in the freezer forever. Um, and they're, it was uh, relatively easy to make if you have a, a food processor. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you for um, <laughs> sure. This is wonderful, Jim Deutsch. You're there, I know, because I saw you earlier. So you're a um, curator in the Smithsonian Folklife uh, department. I'm not sure if it, what uh, it is. Yes. Yes, so and it's the uh, food enthusiast. Yeah, it's the uh, Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. We're a small research and educational unit of the Smithsonian. We produce the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, Smithsonian Folkways Records. So, so my perspective is really that. I mean, I'm I'm Jewish, of course, but but my perspective is really more as a folklorist. And I see we have some other folklorists in the audience. I see Marion Jacobson folklorist in New Jersey. I see Jeff Krulik, whose films are often, I would say, ethnographic in the sense of looking at different groups, and also my colleague at the Smithsonian, um, Arlene Reiniger. And as folklorists, we are interested not only in the ethnic traditions, but also how those traditions may vary from place to place. 
So geography is really essential. Uh, I was born in New York City, grew up just outside Newark, New Jersey, where, of course, you know, we we feel we are the center of Jewish culture in the United States. There's that famous uh, cartoon by Saul Steinberg, uh, Jewish born in Romania, that, you know, focuses on New York and way in the distance, you've got the Rocky Mountains and and the rest of the country. But New Yorkers, we feel we are at the center and that our Jewish cuisine is the best in the world. And we can talk about, you know, whether um, a bagel baked in Bethesda <laughs> comes close to what a bagel based in New York City using New York City water, how they may compare. But of course, New Yorkers feel we are at the center. And that also, I would say that that it's, you know, it's more than the recipe. Um, folklorists use the term foodways, which refers not only to the recipe and the ingredients, but the, the context in which the food is consumed. And one of my favorite examples made by a New Yorker, Woody Allen, the, the movie Annie Hall, where he contrasts having Easter dinner with Annie Hall in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. You know, what could be further from Jewish New York than Chippewa Falls, where they're talking about um, swap meets and boat basins and Easter ham. And then he actually splits the screen to show his family in New York, where the atmosphere is is totally different. And of course, that's that's what I grew up with, you know, not the Annie Hall type of consuming food, but but a table where everyone is talking, everyone is eating at the same, you know, talking and eating, grabbing the food. Um, and that to me is as much as Jewish culture as the actual recipe. Uh, so just, you know, listening to people, you know, Viva talking about Chicago and um, Rena talking about North Carolina and Delaware, there are a variety of Jewish culinary traditions depending on, on where you grew up. And I'll, I'll close, I'm, I'm, I'll share an article that I wrote for our Smithsonian Folklife magazine um, about uh, another Jewish culinary tradition of where do, where do Jews eat on Christmas? Um, we go to Chinese restaurants because the other <laughs> restaurants are closed and we want to go out and have some sort of festive meal. And uh, I mean, that's certainly what we did. Uh, growing up in New York and New Jersey. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, next up, Becky Granitstein. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You're up. So you're a, um, you have a minor in Judaic studies from NYU and you're a social worker, correct? LCSW. I think you're still muted. You have to unmute. She's on a phone. I know it's harder on the phone. Oh, um, okay. Are you? Yeah. Um, I sent her uh, ask to unmute, which hopefully will pop up. Okay. There. Oh, um, there you go. There we go. Hi, okay. Becky. Hi. Um. So I'm sorry. What was that question? Oh, I was looking at social work, right? LCSWC, is that a social yeah. work degree? A minor in Judaic studies. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, um, right. And so that's, that was my, happens to be my uh, formal education in um, Judaism. <laughs> but um, I grew up obviously in a very Jewish household. And, um, I um I guess my earliest memories were I I guess my it, it sort of revolves around schmaltz <laughs> which is um chicken fat which I guess a couple of um speakers ago said um and um that was used in everything and um I particularly remember my bubby bella used to use it when she would make um chick chicken uh chicken liver, um, what was it, chicken, uh, chicken liver, um, um, chopped chicken liver. Chopped liver. Chopped liver, yes, thank you, which was absolutely delicious. 
And um, so everybody loved her chopped liver. It was it was world renowned. And so that that was absolutely amazing. Um, but then there was another thing I wanted to talk about was Shabbat, which um I don't know if anybody's talked about challah. Probably someone did. And um challah is um a braided bread, which is something that is absolutely loved and it's uh has a um an egg sauce over it and is something and then you break off the little chunks that are there and we would celebrate Shabbat most Friday nights in my house and it was something very much look look forward to and um I guess the next thing I want to talk about is uh, Hanukkah. And Hanukkah was something very much loved. We used to have uh, latkes. And some people call them latkes. We call them latkes in my household. And then there was a big debate about what is the best thing to put on top of a latke. Um, some people like applesauce. My big love was sour cream and sugar. Um, and then we have big fights over what is the best thing because they always say for every two Jews there's three opinions <laughs> um and um then um let's see uh then some people like jelly donuts but um I never did very much um that's more of a Sephardi thing and we are um Ashkenazi but um we spent a year in Israel where that was quite prevalent and um, then there was Pesach, and um, we, um, of course, there's the matzah. And I, I don't know if anybody's talked about why we have matzah on um, Pesach, but I, I guess I want to talk about why we have matzah on Pesach. Um, if uh, people don't know, matzah is that uh, flat, um, non-raised uh wafer and it's because we as jews had to escape our enemy really really fast and we um we were fleeing the enemy and we did not have time to break bake our bread so we fleed and that's why we commemorated by eating matzah for eight days and um in our family we really enjoy matzah ball soup once again, for every two Jews, there's three opinions. And what is the best matzo balls? And some people in our family swear by instant. And some people in our family swear by homemade. And some people swear by making it all sorts of different matzo, matzo, matzo ball soup is, is, is made in our, our, our house. Um, Rosh Hashanah is also another one that's very much enjoyed in our, our house. In uh, Rosh Hashanah, there is a another challah. Once again, it's an egg bread, but that's swirled to show the continuation of um, life. Um, and that's very much enjoyed. Also on uh, Rosh Hashanah, you dip the apple in honey to have a sweet new year. Um, and I guess that's about what I got. Um, thank you so much. And um, can we say me? hi to your parents, Be Becky? Yeah, you can. Can everybody say I'm... parents? Um, Maybe they had. They oh, have a hello. Good to see you. My parents are a very wonderful couple. They're. Can you guys want to share? Can you? Can you guys? Yeah. Un can you unmute? Just click the unmute. You know, what, you know what? I can go upstairs and I can go and, and find them. I'm in their house. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we can wait. Bye. Oh, here they got on they got unmuted. Hello. You did great, Becky. Yeah. Becky. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad to know it. <laughs> did, you, did you have a favorite food you wanted to mention? Um, well, <laughs> my mother's latkes and chopped liver, not necessarily chicken chopped liver, uh, 
Cavs' liver was the best, I think. That was just terrific. How about she what? made it with lots of onions, lots of schmaltz. It was great. Oh, that's why it tasted good. What about you, Mom? What, what's your favorite thing? Um, my favorite. Um, let's see. Uh, hard to say, but I like your father my, made chopped oh, berry. Made right? chopped berry oh, that, he, oh. that he learned about when he was in Russia. Before he came to Canada, didn't that take him months to make? Oh, it took three days because he had to dry out the uh, bread outside for three days. To include with and the lots of pepper, everything had lots of pepper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was delicious, though. Yeah, really sure. vinegary. It was so delicious. Ah, that was. Fantastic. Was I the Norman? Yeah. Ah. Was that lots of black pepper or another kind of pepper? Black pepper. Oh, which, okay. You would take the top of the uh, pepper uh, shaker off and uh, shake it into his hand so that there would be enough pepper. Of and... course. He made pickles in a barrel in his cellar, and you can't find pickles like those nowadays yeah they were and just wine. terrific he made his own wine also yeah yeah wow and where where in where in russia was he from minsk he minsk, minsk gabarinya the yeah. province of minsk. The province of minsk white russia belarus and when did he where did he when he came over to toronto when um i'm really not sure of exactly Probably? I probably I think as a, a teenager. So um, it would have a, been just before the First World War. Okay. Yeah. Well, well thank, thank you. Thanks, all of you. This is fascinating. And good to see you too. So um next, Rachel Bernard. I'm not sure if she was able to make it. Are you on? No. No, so, but her friend, Jeff Krulik, who was mentioned earlier, <laughs> Jeff is here. Maybe he has a, a quick share. Hi, no, Jeff. No. Hi. My mom's. Hello. I don't really start my video. Great. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Okay, ready to go. Hello. Hello. Where are you? Oh, here he is. Now, yeah, Rachel couldn't be here. Rachel couldn't make it. Right. Well, wow, I look great, don't I? It's like well, tell I, us a, a quick family food memory you have. You're a storyteller, as <laughs> a filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, um. Well, my mom's uh, actually my my uh, grandmother, my nana's uh, canadals. You know her matzo balls were just the best and uh apparently when i was a little kid um I, when i was little i told my grandmother my father's mother because this was, nana was mom's mother that i said these i told her these 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 canadals aren't as good as nana's so um and nana's uh you know mom made them and you know they were they were uh really wonderful um Unfortunately, they, you know, the recipe's gone now with mom. But um uh, interesting story. I will say regarding Jewish uh, you know, culinary traditions for me, um, I grew up with latkes from a box. I always thought that it was like, and they tasted great. They still taste great to me. I still like uh, you know, latkes from a mix. But uh, I do remember when um a non-Jewish girlfriend made latkes from scratch. Uh, and it was like, I couldn't believe it. I thought that was like, it was like, I, I, I always thought they came from a box. I always thought that was how you were, you, uh, you uh, made them. And I, I, I guess, cause we just smothered them in, with applesauce. Um, uh, I still have it. That's still the latke I, 
think I prefer, quite honestly. No offense to anybody who makes them from scratch. Um, but, uh, you know, I grew up with chicken on every every Friday night. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know if anybody had problems finding fruit slices this year at Passover. Um, they didn't seem to be in the grocery store, at least where my dad was. I mean, he was complaining he couldn't get fruit slices. So uh, I, I'm, I don't think I've added much to this conversation, but um, <laughs> I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good to see you, Jeff. Good to Thanks. see you. So pulling up the rear, Toba Hausner, I think you're still on, right? So yes, you're I vice president. Right, vice president of the Greater Silver Spring Democratic Club and yes. a proud Bubby. So yes. all yours. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to be sharing more memories from my childhood rather than recipes. So um, I grew up in a suburb of Boston called Dorchester. It was a heavily Jewish community and I lived in a multi-generational family. I lived with my parents, my brother, my Bobby, Zadie, and an aunt. Um, my family spoke Yiddish, and so I was privy to many secrets that the neighbors would come and talk about. My mother and Bobby shared the cooking responsibilities. My aunt didn't like to cook, but she did all the dishes happily. So that was a good thing. We celebrated Shabbat every week. We lit the candles and we had a traditional meal. Now the meals didn't leave such a lasting impression on me, but my Bobby made challah, babka, sweet rolls, and various other baked goods. And that's what I remember, the taste, the smell, and that was Shabbat for me. My mother was also a good baker, but in a different way. She loved to bake pies and she could handle any dough and bake any pie. And I particularly remember her lemon meringue pies and her blueberry pie. Now, I'm not very good with dough, but speaking of the meringue, I can make an excellent meringue cookie. Whoa. I've been told that they're really delicious and outstanding. And they've become part of our traditions and some of our holiday celebrations. My mother was also known for her jelly roll. I don't know. And I still have her jelly roll pan. And most recently for Pesach, Passover, I made a jelly roll. And that jelly roll turned out to be a birthday cake for two of my sons-in-law, who celebrate their birthdays one day apart. We actually decorated the jelly roll and we sang happy birthday. Um, for other holidays at, for instance, at Hanukkah, like my, my Bobby and my mother, I remember, always had company for Hanukkah. And we lived in a very small house, a very small place with a kitchen, a living room, but no dining room. But it was always full of people. And they used to stand there at the gas stove and grate the latkes and fry them while everybody was in the house. And I don't remember that they ever sat down to eat at the table. I currently make latkes for my family and I saw also do it from scratch, but I do sit down and eat. But I use no machinery, no shortcuts. It's definitely from scratch. So my family of origin was financially poor, but very rich in love and generosity. We always had people coming to eat. And I think our motto was, all who are hungry, come and eat. And as you all know, that is coming from the Haggadah as well. Um, our current traditions for Hanukkah, we have um, a party every year with extended family. My younger daughter's in-laws are always part of our Hanukkah celebration. So we continue that tradition with our own family 
and in-laws. And for the la until the pandemic, we always had a breakfast and we had about 35 people here with the traditional um, foods. For us, it was um, puggles and um, blint souffles and salads and whatever. But one of the things that I made was a recipe from my aunt given to me many, many years ago, um, which is a cucumber mold. I know cucumber, I know molds are not so welcome these days, but in our house it's become a tradition and we jokingly call it aspic. And it's made in my vintage Tupperware mold and it always comes out perfectly. Um, Another tradition that we have in our family, about 30 years ago, my brother and his wife started a Seder, a third Seder, so that family who were not in the same geographic area could come together on the Saturday night in between the beginning of Pesach and the end. So this year we hosted it and we had family from Boston, New York, Virginia, and our own family here from Maryland. We had about 17 people here. And what I wanna say about this year that was significant for me was when we lit the candles for the holiday, we also lit a Yorkshire candle so that we remembered the hostages currently and we remembered all the people who were not at our table this year. So I remember my family traditions and now we have our own traditions with um, our daughters and family. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. That was wonderful. And I think you're the last, I just wanted to add a story of my own and also say that my husband, when we make the latkes for Hanukkah, my husband grates the onion and he came up with the solution of using his swimming goggles. So that was always like the thing I couldn't stand about making latkes. So he makes, he grates the onions. And I just wanted to tell this story because I've heard so many wonderful stories this evening. I remember one year, my mom always made the best simis with carrots and brown sugar. And I remember calling her and saying, what's the rest, you know, how do you make it? What do you do? How much brown sugar? what should I put in? And she said, you know, carrots and water and brown sugar. And I said, well, how much brown sugar? And she said, well, and she paused. She said, well, just, just put in enough. And then she paused again and she said, but don't put in too much. <laughs> so it was kind of, you know, <laughs> give and take, but that's how my mom was. And I'm sure a lot of you can um, have similar stories. So um, I think, Lisa, do I want to hand it over? Do you want to hey, take the well, reins? I think, well, um, I think we have time for some questions or comments or if if anyone else has their own uh, food memory to share. Um, so, yeah, I, me I mentioned people should put in the in the comments any recommendations for uh, restaurants, bakeries, and delis. Um, I know there are, um, what are, what are the names of the delis in Silver Spring, the Jewish delis? Um, I don't know about Silver Spring, but there's Atman's and then there's Bro the Brooklyn deli. Okay. They're kind of like delis. Okay. Parkway deli. Parkway. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, so is there anyone else who anyone else that hadn't shared yet, or so one of our panelists, if they had another comment or question? I have another comment about okay, Toba, is it? about the onions. Okay. During the pandemic, I learned that if you put your mask on and you put rubber, you know, latex gloves on or some sort of gloves that the onions, at least for me, don't bother me at all. Oh, okay. So that's my little tidbit. Do they, does it protect your eyes too? Does it kind of coat it or? 
No, but I guess because you're not smelling the onion, it doesn't make your eyes water. Oh, if you have the mask on. If you have the mask on and you're not have you don't have the smell on your hands, so it's not affecting the eyes. Huh. Hey, can I ask, has anyone here ever made gefilte fish from scratch? I've always wanted to do it, but I've never done it. Gefilte fish. Yeah. <laughs> My aunt used to make a filter fish from scratch and it was really, oh. really good. How, do you know, have any idea how it's prepared? I I made the filter fish from scratch. Oh, okay. I Hi, Lisa. Lena, would you like to yeah, share? I, um, I, I'm sorry, my camera is not working. So uh, uh, I made it uh, from carp. That was the best, hmm. you know, the carp. Mm -hmm. we, we used to buy it uh, uh, I am from Russia and we used to buy it uh, live so and then uh, what you do is you uh, you cut it in pieces and um, of course you clean it and everything cut it in pieces then you take out uh, the meat the you know the flesh but try not to uh, uh, damage the skin. And the skin stays on the uh, skeleton. And then whatever meat, <laughs> so-called, you have, you uh, ground it and you put lots of onions, uh, uh, fresh and um, uh, fried. And also some, uh, uh, like a uh, mm, okay, uh, bread. You uh, soak bread in in milk or or in water, and then you add some bread there, and you add the eggs, raw eggs. So that makes it the uh, filling, and then you put the filling back uh, where it belonged. <laughs> in, uh, you know, between the skin and uh, the, um, and, and the bones. And then you put everything carefully into the big pot and put some, again, raw onions and some uh, fried onions and then some water and, and uh, carrots. And then you cook it for maybe like three, four hours and very, very low uh, um, heat, like simmering, like four hours. And then, and then it becomes like brownish and absolutely delicious. And I forgot, of course, pepper and some salt, of course, and uh, pe uh, the uh, pepper into the water, in, into the broth. So that's how it is. That's how, oh. and then you, you have your um, your pieces like like real pieces of of uh, fish. So that that's that's what it it is. Thank you. It's involved. Yes, <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> I have to try it sometime now. Yeah, I think any fish, even, you know what, I take a uh, gefilte fish uh, from the jar and I also cook it, uh, put some, uh, that broth that is in the jar and then uh, uh, fried onions and raw onions and then cook mm -hmm. maybe a couple hours and you'll see how good it is. Oh. Mm -hmm. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great tip. You can try. You I cook the it. fish for a couple of hours. Uh huh. That that oh. already cooked, like a very very slow simmering with onions, the fried onions and mm. uh, and raw onions in that broth that you have, you know, in the jar. Try that. It's very good. Mm hmm. I will. Warsaw, the ghetto wall. I really don't think this is the Warsaw ghetto. Oops, that was Jane. 
think. Hi, Jade. Um, so who else has a uh a, a food to share? Jill, Jill, hi, I see you. I, I had to put everybody on a uh, gallery so I could just find very quickly two funny stories. Uh, one on yeah. the gefilte, one on the gefilte fish. So over 50 years ago, when I met my husband, um, he wanted me to meet his grandma. Okay. And um, she was like the queen, the matriarch of the family. And so I went to his, I went to his house and actually his aunt's house. And we went down the basement and in the basement was, in my opinion, from a Sarah. Okay. It was his <laughs> grandmother and she was dressed in white and she was making a filter fish for, for, I guess it was Rosh Hashanah. And it was, I will never forget what that looked like. She was the most amazing. She was a little like a four for 10 lady and um gefilte fish came out delicious but she scared the living daylights out of me <laughs> um, so that's one story the other thing is my mom always said um because i love to cook and we do a lot of uh baking and challah and all of the above um my mom used to tell me two things um in terms of her her th these were her secret in secrets a, if you added mushroom and onions, saute mushroom and onions to anything, your everybody would be very happy around the table um, because that changes everything from the um, chopped liver to to veal to whatever. So that was that's the second thing. And the third thing is, um, I had my mom's cookbook, and this somebody made reference to this before. I had my mom's cookbooks, but um, they didn't tell you what the temperature was and they didn't tell you how long you should cook it. And I, and I asked her many times because I said, mom, I have your, you know, your recipes and things like that. And she says, you just have to know. She says, you have to know your oven. She says, and you just have to know when it's done. And at first I thought it was a joke. Okay. Now it's 70 plus years later. She's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. And knowing your oven makes a difference in terms of how it's calibrated, but looking at it, um, it happened all during, um, um, what do you call it? Um, I have to bring up a bunch of things to New York. I run, a, I run the Seders in New York and then come back here and our house is, was just put back together yesterday. Um, so, um, the, it's it just kind of funny because it's how many different ways do you make the, the haroset that people talked about? How many different ways do you make? I make Passover granola that I take up to New York so that everybody can have it after the, uh, during the holiday for like, if they have to go to work so they can have it with their yogurt. And sometimes we put in, um, chocolate chips and sometimes we put in um all the dried fruits and and the other thing was was the same thing with the mandel bread okay the mandel bread each thing had to be set for each for the different people that were getting it in new york this one doesn't couldn't do the the pj uh, the the recipe that somebody said with all the nuts okay so and some people like chocolate chips some people like um um, chunks of chocolate. And so you learn each thing and you make little notes. And so every time I open Passover by design, every single year, I have all the papers shoved in there and they have little notes. I also, I also, the other example, just very quickly is I make a fruit relish because there is a cousin in New York who loves fruit relish. So you put all the, um, you get all the different dried fruits and, you know, boil them up and you add liquor to it and whatever. And people like it all whole, okay? When I bring it home and I make my luncheons at home during Pesach, I um, use the immersion blender. And then I have like almost like, um, like a sorbet before dessert. 
and it's it's delicious and it's got everything in it and it's very good for your system everybody understands when you're eating matzah and you have the fruit relish it's a good thing um and um yeah but but the story um the Haggadah is lehagid and lehagid is to tell the story and to pass the story on the narratives um um you know um through the families and from generation to generation la door by door that's it <laughs> the <Thanks>. end <laughs> <laughs> thank you so <laughs> So anyone else want to chime in with stories or lasts? Oh, the matzo bride. Oh, God. Pardon? There I just had a question for Jill really quick. What did you say? You described your husband's grandmother as Pacera? Um, she was, she was, um, she was a bubby. Oh, so oh, what does oh, Pacera I, I, mean? No, no, no. Okay, I just I described her as from a Sarah from Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, the character. Okay, oh, I see the character that okay. comes out from a Sarah from a Sarah. That's okay. what she like. That's what she. Okay, like. I didn't hear her so well. No, sorry, that's, okay. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> story. That was great. Okay, so I think Ken has a question or comment. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I still love lox and bagels with cream cheese. Now I toast the bagel and have it with tomatoes and onions. And also, my mother turned me on to this. She's long gone, she, um, but I'm sure you guys know what matzah farfel is. You can, it's cut up matzah. You can boil it with water and kind of make a hot cereal out of it. I've done everything but just have um, melted butter and milk with it to putting honey, applesauce, raisins, anything like that. I'm no gourmet chef like some of you guys appear to be. The other thing I will say is that Whole Foods, not to say lovely things about, you know, Jeff Bezos, but they do have really nice matzo ball soup that they make there. Um, also, I had been wondering, considering that this is a Jewish cultural event here, if any of you guys would be are interested in Israeli and Jewish music, I am a music journalist, so that's why I posted that. And Paula, I would ask, are you on Facebook? Could I find you there? Yes, I am on Facebook. Okay, I'm Ken Roseman, and my picture, so you'll be able to identify this. I have a, um, I have a black t-shirt on with the name of a very famous English folk rock band, and the person I'm standing next to is their lead singer. Okay. It's Steel Eye Span, if you've ever heard of them. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. For, for Ken, no matter, even if we're talking about African-American doll making, all roads lead to Steel Eye Span. They can. <laughs> it's it's not always inappropriate. <laughs> okay. Good to see you, Ken. I, do you happen to know the history of locks and bagels? Is that, isn't that a New York invention? Mm, I don't know. No, bagels uh, are from Europe. They're but from the Europe. locks. The locks yeah. and the basils. Yeah. Damn. They're from Europe. Yeah, I I don't know if I've seen bagels in Europe, and I've lived in three European countries, but does Jim Just, know or one of the academics on here about uh, the history of locks and bagels? Lovely to have I didn't. I, it's all those villages and those people were all murdered. And there is this book, which I put in the chat because somebody asked about Bialis. There's a book by Mimi Sheraton called The Biali Eaters. And Bialis come from this town, Bialystok, and mm -hmm. they were very famous for the Bialis, but they were all murdered and the rest, the original recipe is all gone and the community yeah. is all dead. I knew that, so that I knew the Ollies were from you. Yeah, I knew they were yeah. from you, but I thought it had become they had become bagels and then the combination of lox and bagels. I thought it happened in the uh, New York. Oh, you could be right about that, but the bagels I mean, themselves and just yeah. smoked fish is you're yeah. from yeah. Europe. Yeah. I think yeah, bagels. Um, um, there's actually a long history of anti-Semitism associated with bagels. Um, the <laughs> church outlawed the that Jewish people were no longer allowed to make bread 
Um, and so, but we were allowed to um, make, they were, we were allowed to make bread not, that was not whole. And so by making it on a stick and selling it on a stick, it became a bagel shape. Um, and this was actually during medieval times, just to oh. share a little bit of history. Yeah. Jim, did you have something else about uh, that? Well, actually, uh, exactly that, which, yeah, that there were mm -hmm. laws preventing Jews from baking bread. So they came up with the bagel. And this was in, in the area that is now um, Eastern Poland. I mean, Bialystok is a mm -hmm. city in Eastern Poland, but that whole area, you know, the kind of the um, the Pale of Settlement, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. That's where we think bagels emerged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They used it in The Producers. Do you know the, the show, The Producers? There was yeah, a of course. From 1968. I've never seen, <laughs> yeah. never seen the Broadway show. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, like that. Um, somebody... They used it as his last name, Max Bialystok. Yes, Bialystok. Max oh, right. Bialystok. Yeah. That's right. Um, yes, Max Bialystok. Um, somebody asked why Bubby, her, her name was Nanny Sylvia, why she was in white um, when she was down in the kitchen. Um, it was a very pure kind of ceremony, you know, like that, um, that um, she felt like um, you know, like the carp in the bathtub. She felt like she was, it was the tradition of making, the, getting that fish and the, and turning it into gefilte fish and everything like that. And it all came from, I don't know, it's like an etchug. It's just, it's, it's a very pure, I don't know what she wore, uh, you know, whatever, but she was scary. <laughs> okay. okay. So I'm, um, can yeah. I say, there's Go a ahead. really cute 10-minute movie I saw during the pandemic. It said about um, gefilte fish. I posted yeah. it in the chat. It's yeah. in Hebrew, but it's got English subtitles. And Tell the me. premise is this girl's going to get married to the boy, and the, she has to go make a, get the fish and kill it to make a gefilte fish. Exactly. exactly. Um, surprise ending. That's all. Right. It's worth the time. And it's the kid's version of uh, um, the carp in the bathtub. Oh. <laughs> Great. Anyway. Yeah, and so Gary Gary mentions that uh, locks are from uh, Scandinavia. Um, and they, they met up with bagels in New York. <laughs> Somebody asked a question. I think bagels <laughs> came before Bialy's. What does anyone else think? Oh. Okay. Um, oh dear. I don't know. I'm not the historian, so Paula, that would be you. I have no idea. Really interesting question. No, no. Yeah. Bialis, bialis are um, it's it's a piece of dough, uh, stuffed with uh, meat, uh, and uh, with ground meat, but with the um open in the middle they're open you can see the the meat you know them <laughs> it's like, yeah, like that. yeah they're it's... stuffed with meat that's pierogies right it's a pierogies no but uh, right, are... pierogies also baked uh, uh but if you open on the top and you you will see the meat uh so that they're round they're round uh, and uh, uh, the, the meat is is uh, uh, is shown in the middle, right? And but the, then you know me, or no. you fry it. <laughs> when you fry it, you put it uh, the meat down first, and then you turn it uh, to the uh, um, uh, dough uh, dough side. But that that's what bialis were mm -hmm. and are. They were called bialis in Russia. I I saw a lot of those type of pastries stuffed with meat in Russia okay. and former you, you know Eastern Europe. Lots of uh, um, uh, lots of uh, different kinds of food are mixed with uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
different nationalities in former Soviet Union, they they use the same, but they may call them differently. So uh, I know that uh, this uh, in Russian language, it called Bielashi, not Bialis. Mm -hmm. Bialis are uh, probably Yiddish name. Uh, Bielashi is Russian name. So that that's, uh, and I know that people like different uh, uh, different nations in uh, in the former Soviet Union also eat that uh, Tatars, for example. It, it, it it's mm -hmm. just very common food. Yeah. Well, yeah. the word Bialy, yeah, um, the word Bialy means white in mm -hmm. in all mm -hmm. Slavic languages. Right. Like, right. You know, Biel, uh, Belarus, it's mm -hmm. the same word means white Russia. So Bialys were made from white flour. And I right. think that's why they got that name. And I think that someone pointed out, uh, is this why cafeteria workers tend to wear white? Uh, so do nurses, um, because it's to demonstrate that you're clean when you're, because you have to be extra clean when you're handling food or doing nursing, medical stuff. So I think it's to show that you're clean. Uh, Lisa, if you if you want, I'm not going to put it in the chat because I don't do chat. Um, uh, Tina Wasserman um, is my BFF. She is a grand dame chef. She lives in Texas, in Texas, and she has a book called Entree yeah. to Judaism, a culinary ex um, exploration of a Jewish diaspora, and it answers all these questions. And and she's a a, a an amazing, an amazing um, um, cook. And, On traded Judaism, a what was a it? Culinary, a culinary exploration of the Jewish diaspora. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I put it in the chat. She has a, she has a kids' book too. So oh. just so you know, when you see you open up, you have like the person who was on who has the three kids. Um, it had it has the breakdown of making kala or soup or whatever it is, um, a kugel or like that, really um, with kids being able to help out and not get hurt and, and measuring mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, she's amazing. She writes for mm -hmm. the, uh, she writes for the Texas Jewish Post and she is on the board of the uh, reform movement. So, yeah. Great. And then uh, Marissa is recommending the Jewish Book of Food by Claudia Rodan. Um, okay, I see Ken has another comment. Yeah, it is um, a food question. It is a strictly or, food uh, or question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've gotten some stuff that is called lox spread. But when I looked at the contents, it said imitation salmon. Any of you guys have any idea what that is? It's fake. <laughs> it doesn't is it sound English good. Dish? Is it, do you know what it is? Any idea? It should be in the ingredients. Is it, does it say tilapia? It's probably farm-raised tilapia because it's cheap. It yeah. just says imitation salmon. Or it could be a vegetarian, vegan kind of thing. Right. Like it could be something oh, else. That's good too. Right. Uh -huh. Should I get the little container and show it to you all? <laughs> no, you, have to read, you have to read the side and see what it says. All right, hold on for a second. What, what was it called, Ken? Imitate locks spread. I'll go get locks spread. Okay. Mm -hmm. Often, as imitation stuff like that is just some kind of uh, white fish that has coloring in it <laughs> and yes, a little it's bit like, it's like it's like it's like it's like kosher imitation crab meat. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Same. Kind yeah. Of thing. And they somehow make, uh, well, they in imitation crab. I had a wheat allergy for 12 years until I went on cancer medication. It was like the bright side of it. I no longer have my wheat allergy, so I can eat all kinds of bread now. Um, but yeah, uh, crab, imitation crab has wheat in it. A lot of people don't know, uh, and sugar. So nothing to do with fish. Yeah, okay, right. Ken, we, you have to read it. Uh, we can't okay, see it. Okay, it, it's called, oh, let me make sure. Oh, okay, it's called Smoked Salmon Dip. It's by a company called Salads of the Sea. And when I, 
I mean, it's hard to read the ingredients, unfortunately. <laughs> Very hard. Um, but the first... <laughs> So hard. so hard to read this. Ah. Okay. Well, we can Google it too. Um, Wait a minute. Maybe you can find a magnifying glass. Flashlight. Ken, does it taste good? Do you like it? It's <laughs> well. I've been. You know, it, it's okay. It's not the same as actual <laughs> lox and cream cheese. It is not the same. But it's a lot cheaper. Of course. It's because it's missing the main ingredient. Yeah. That, no. <laughs> main ingredient is probably styrofoam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly, Gary. Oh, I didn't say it. You said it. It wasn't me. It no, ain't nothing like the real thing, baby, baby. as the song goes. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, great. Well, well, well. what is it called again, Ken? Because we can look it up. Smoked Salmon Dip. The company is called Salads of the Sea, made of imitation salmon. Imi that's what it says. Imitation salmon. Additional. I can't read it. Okay. It's just that salmon is expensive, so it's probably... Just a cheaper fish, like then. Yeah, maybe I not, was wondering no. if it was cheaper fish or if it was just mm -hmm. totally made out of plant material. Ooh, you never know these days. Okay, wait a minute. There is there is something called imitation salmon roe. Hmm. Um, and it's supposed to look like uh, what do you call it? Well, they sell those, oh, the, the roe eggs, the, um, yeah. you know, at Ikea. I love that stuff. Yeah. Probably and not very healthy, though. I mean, because I think it has salt. other ingredients. Okay, okay. No, salt's ready? good for you. Okay, oh, it has, like, vegetable oil or something in it. Uh, oh, no, 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 I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Sorry. What is imitation salmon made? Okay, you ready? <laughs> you ready? Water, konjac sure. powder. I never eat anything. I don't know what it looks, what it is. Uh, potato starch. It's good for Passover. Um, olive oil, pea protein, sea salt, seaweed powder. It's vegan. It's all vegan. Ah, so that's the idea. All vegan with yeah. a little calcium hydroxide just to finish it off. Ah, well, thank does that you. Look like this one, or is that different Thanks. stuff? No, it's a, it says in general that's what it is. It's um it's non-GMO. Um, but interesting, this one is made in a in a facility that also uses tree nuts. I found another one. Can I share the screen? Sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me find you. I have to find you, Jane. You want to be able to share your screen? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Sophie's kitchen. Thank you, co-host and spotlight. All righty. Remarkable. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you see it? Coming. Yeah. Yes. Oh, there it is. Smoked it's... salmon. There you are. Protein, Imitation. Pollock and or salmon. Oh, there, it does have yeah, fish. cheaper okay. white fish, basically. Yeah. Wait, second it ingredient. Any is... fish in it or is it or totally vegetarian? Wheat. This no, is it the first thing. You know what? It's actually like a filter fish. Yes. It's a mix of fishes. It's a all mix right. of fishes with all the extra junk in it. But that's what it is because pollock and whiting, you see that on the side of a uh, grilled to fish jar. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think right. that's the other brand of smoked salmon dip that I saw. This is. That's from this salads. One. Well, no, salads of the sea. This is it. Okay. Yes, this is salads of the sea, and it's uh, Lakeview good. Farms no, is the company. Good. I mean, so it's it not... does have fish as the first thing, or does it say it says fish protein? Yeah, fish protein, yeah. pollock, da, da 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 da. So fish is okay. the main ingredient. It's number one. But some of those words you can't, you've never heard of, or can't really pronounce, or probably no, it's not. all real words. Pollock, no, phosphate, sodium. The things at the end are probably not. Um, carmine is from shrimp, I know. It's a for the dye, for the color. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, so that's how okay. you got the I'm going to stop the share. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Thanks, well, everybody. And fun. Yeah. Well, we'll be Great kind session. of wrapping up. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to everybody and all the participants. That this was, was really wonderful. Thank you, Lisa, for pulling wow. this all together, too, and organizing so much of it. We yes. have to have a chapter thank two. You. Thank you so much for hosting Paula and helping pull it together. It went really well. These are always so fun, and I'm always yeah. hungry after <laughs> after it's over. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Paula. And thanks okay. for all the uh, uh, old dinner. world. Thanks for all the old country type discussions. I really enjoyed. I love those. Especially. Yeah, they were great. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind everybody: May twenty second mm -hmm. at seven o'clock, we're going to have the. Jewish Voices Through Poetry, and it's in person, so it would be great if a lot of people showed up. It's at the Silver Spring um, Civic Building.